Hello everyone. Uh, welcome to today's uh, HR Zone webinar. Today brought to you in association with ADP. Uh, you've joined probably one of our most hard-hitting webinars in the HR Zone lineup. Um, we're looking six years into the future, doing a bit of uh, crystal ball gazing, um, and seeing what role HR will play in Workforce 2020, and also what the business world will look like in 2020, what forces uh, will be brought to bear on HR and in the business world, uh, and just what HR needs to be doing uh, to cope uh, with the changes that are going to be happening. Uh, in Workforce 2020. Very hard hitting, uh, very exciting as well. It's a pretty uh, impressive uh, future for HR. Uh, we've got two presenters on today. Uh, first one is Mark Martin, uh, who has over 25 years experience uh, on a range of boards, T-Mobile, um, Direct Line Group, and also Bridget Penny, who uh, currently works for ADP, and she has 20 years uh, of HR experience. So two people with a lot uh, of experience in knowing where HR is going uh, and what the future is going to look like. Um, you can actually, I'm just going to move the slides uh, on here, and you can see on your screen at the moment uh, a slide of what your platform should look like at the moment. Uh, there's a nice piece of uh, tech happening here, because uh, you can see the slides up in the middle there, and then on the right-hand side, uh, you should see the group chat uh, as well. Um, and you can type all your questions uh, and uh, your comments in there. Now, on the left-hand side, you've got the Your Presenter screen. You've got Mark's profile there, and underneath you've got Bridget, um, so you can see everything about them. Uh, underneath. Uh, then you've got the resource list. Uh, there's just a couple of extra bits of information uh, on the topic that we're going to be talking about. Uh, at the top of the screen on the left-hand side, you've got the media player, um, and that is just the audio stream, so you uh, can hear us and what we're going to be talking about. Um, at the bottom of your screen, I'll just move the slides on, you should be able to see that now, you have uh, four, uh, no, sorry, six buttons. Uh, they correspond uh, to uh, the pieces that you can see on the screen, so the media player, uh, the group chat, the presenters, uh, and the other functionality. If your functionality should ever disappear during the uh, webcast, if you just click those at, at the bottom uh, and you'll bring them back up. Uh, if you can't currently see the group chat, the red button, uh, which you should see uh, presented on your slides now, if you click that, that will bring the group chat up. Uh, and you can type all your comments uh, and questions in there if it isn't appearing already. Uh, I don't know if you guys just want to do that, just so we know you're live and kicking and ready to take part in this webinar. Uh, and hopefully I'll see some comments coming through. Uh, now, while you're doing that, uh, I'm going to pass on over to Bridget, who's going to just give a few thoughts on ADP's uh, idea of the future uh, of Workforce 2020 and what they feel the role of technology will be in that future. So over to you, Bridget. Thanks, Jamie. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Um, as Jamie said, I'm Bridget Penny. I uh, actually lead our HFR, HR efforts for our sales force outside of North America. I'm from Chicago, so pardon the accent to those of you who know uh, the Chicago accent. Um, Yet, yet have the privilege actually of being on assignment here in beautiful Paris and, and I've worked in the international space for the last several years of my HR career. So, you know, the first thing I want to lead with is, you know, one of the great things about working at ADP as an HR professional at a human capital management company is your internal clients like you. I mean, they really like you. So you're the one they sell to, they service, they design for. And while I face many of the day-to-day -day challenges that really all of us experience in HR, um, I, I have the ability to leverage the best and brightest solutions to solve those organizational issues. So eight, while ADP is known around the world for payroll and HR services, a growing number of our over 620,000 uh, clients know that we also provide services across the entire spectrum of HCM. So managing that full cycle, full life cycle of employees from recruitment to retirement, really for every size organization across the world. And I thought I'd kick us off by highlighting actually a recent survey, a very recent survey we conducted here in ADP 
um, with our international uh, audience. And that highlights you know, some of the, the key HR priorities over the next few years. First and foremost, no surprise, ensuring that the talent strategy is aligned with business needs. So 93% of CEOs recognize the need to change or are changing their strategies to attract and retain talent. And you know, here's the tough news, I think, for us HR professionals is only two-thirds of those CEOs believe that we, the HR function, is really well prepared to respond to this trend. The second area of focus um, that's, on, that's on our CEO's mind is, is really ensuring that we're fostering impactful learning and development. 64% of CEOs are saying that creating a skilled workforce is a next priority for their organization, is, is, is a key priority for their organization over the next three years. Improving employee engagement continues to be a focus, and, and we know that companies with high levels of employee engagement report a same-year operating margin nearly three times higher than companies with low level of engagement. And finally, a key priority is attracting and retaining top talent. Um, the war on talent is still here. Managing the talent pipeline, um, ensuring employers are trying to recruit ahead of the curve so we can engage employees with particular skills and aptitudes bearing our future business needs. So what you don't see up here on this list is how to pay people, how to get someone efficiently transferred to a new role, or how to min administer merit planning for a cross-border team. So these are foundational expectations of the business. And I'll tell you, in, in my 20 years of experience in HR, now having worked in, in um, the outside of the U.S. space, I found there are some really unique administrative, I'm going to call them burdens, to working in the international space, simply because of the country-to-country -country laws and processes. So having said that, you know, we just talked about what's important, ensuring we have the right engaged talent to meet our fu future needs. You know, how are we as HR professionals going to really um, achieve this? And, and to do that, we need to focus on what matters and do all we can do to remove that day-to-day -day administrative burden through standardization, automation, automation, and outsourcing of transactional tasks. So let me just take a moment and um, show you, you know, how we support our leaders and, and really what ADP is built around, um, a comprehensive human capital management solution. And while definitions of HCM may differ um, Within the last year, we really put a stake in the ground and clearly defined HCM at ADP. So this is how we see it. We serve our clients through the breadth of recruitment to retirement. Some of our key solutions include payroll, HR, talent, time, benefits. And all these are driven by technology and ongoing HCM innovation. At the heart of all this is our, our key differentiator, which is service, um, support, compliance, which we know is, is particularly key in the international space, and offering ongoing key insight, insights. So, you know, we really think we're uniquely positioned to serve client needs. So before I turn it over, uh, you know, I thought it'd be fun to, you know, as we consider Workforce 2020, a new generation arrives in our companies with a new way to access and consume information, to manage careers, to network with others, et cetera. We in HR need to be really prepared to adapt to this environment. So I wanted to highlight for you um, something I think really cool happening in ADP. Early in 2014, we opened our innovation lab in New York City. We recruited a highly skilled team of about 150 designers, which include researchers, engineers, even anthropologists, data scientists. And their sole focus is on accelerating the pace of technical innovation and solution development. Some of the key areas they're working on, you can see up here, next user experience, social, social HCM, predictive analytics, and I'll talk a little bit about that later, but really leveraging ADP big data to, to give you insights into your business, benchmarking, collaboration tools. So obviously we at ADP are really excited about this organization's leadership to, to help us continue to rethink human capital management. With that, Jamie, happy to turn it back to you and go to the next part of our program. Thanks very much, Bridget. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but uh, the word that was in my head uh, through all that was change. 
uh, change, 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 uh, and expectation uh, as well. I think those two uh, really stood out. And I think you know one of the topics that will come through your mind as we get into Mark's presentation as well will really be change. There is a lot of change happening in HR and in the business world. And what's really interesting uh, here is how those two coincide. Uh, and, and, and where they're going to meet, and also as HR professionals, where where we will be, uh, you know, as that happens. Um, we have had in the chat someone says that they're listening in from Spain. Uh, that's uh, you know pretty far afield. I was wondering if anyone is listening in from any further afield. If you are, put it in the uh, chat box, and we'll we'll uh, let ev everyone know. Um, okay, great. Thanks very much, Bridget. Uh, I'll now pass on to uh, Mark to give his presentation into Workforce 2020. Mark, over to you. Hi, thanks, Jamie, and thanks, Bridget, and welcome to the webinar. Uh, I want to make a one point really clear through this presentation. HR is facing its ultimate challenge. The change Bridget just talked about could mean a fantastic future for the function. It could also mean a very challenging one. The other point I want to make, um, in case it gets lost in the presentation, is this is all about technology. Technology is a big part of the reason things are changing, and technology is the only way you're going to cope with the challenges you will face. Okay, I'm going to spend a bit of time on my introduction, not because I like talking about myself, but I think there's three points that are important. The first is that I've recently left a, a senior uh, top table role to set up my own business called Foundation Stones. And this business is set up to be part of the change I'm about to talk about. So you might not believe what I have to say, but you can certainly believe that I believe it because I put it, all my eggs in this basket. Second key point, without being arrogant, you never want to be at this here, but I think you need to know I have been on these top tables. I have experienced what I'm about to talk to you about. I haven't just heard about it. I've experienced it. So I believe it. Um, I've, my last role as uh, Group HRD for Direct Line we had to completely rebuild a HR function, seven new HR systems, over £40 million spent. That, that was a high-pressured time where we had to get some things right that I had been getting wrong in my career before. So I've got some things to talk about. The last thing is technology. My whole career has been about technology. I put the first relational data, database into Unilever. Um, I built my own system in the 90s, for which I'm still receiving therapy, but it was an important experience. Um, and recently, all the new systems and direct line and everything I did at T-Mobile. So I, I've been doing that because I know technology is key. I've got far more wrong than I've got right, but I certainly have some experience on it. So that's uh, my, my uh, experience and, and I guess why I feel I'm able to say the following things. And that is that HR um, and the way we manage people is being challenged. What we've been doing is not what we need to do. Just looking at this example of uh, one survey that I think is very good, where the HR, global HR directors themselves, assess themselves as C-minus. Now, they were D-plus in the previous year's survey, but they're still saying C-minus could do better. We know as a function that the business is already asking us for things we are struggling to deliver. So what are those things? The other thing that uh, is on that slide that's important is this is in the UK, the CIPD is the uh, most important um, professional organization, and the chief exec recently said HR needs to develop a common language that is used across business to talk about people and the value they create. You have to look at that and find, one, he's right, and two, it's an extraordinary statement that we don't share a language in his view, and I think he's right, with business to talk about the, the value people add. Just challenge yourself. Do you have such a language? Um, in, and I'm going to hopefully help um, talk about what that language might be. So let's talk about clever but disconnected. This is my phrase. This is where I think we have um, arrived as a function. And I'm going to tell you some stories to, to bring it out. Um, and some of them I, I'm actually going to name and shame. Uh, and it's all about me and shaming myself, I guess. But back in 1992 in Geese, uh, there was an incident where we put in what we thought was a very clever um, re uh, recruitment process and a very clever guy, and I've got to watch I don't use his name because he's currently a main board director of a FTSE 100 company, um, attended uh, very early in his life to be a production supervisor um, and walked out having accepted the job as a trainer. 
They went through the whole of the process that I thought was very good. Um, he thought he was being interviewed for one job. They thought they were interviewing for another, and he still took the wrong job. He was a terrible training manager, but he ended up being an extremely good buyer. Uh, that was in 1992. By 2006, we developed a much cleverer understanding of what we could do with recruitment. And I, I was, uh, as HR director in T-Mobile, I went to recruit a uh, recruitment of a vice president in, in my function, HR, for the customer services area. We went through a process, and at the end of that process, uh, uh, we had all scored in this very objective, clever system enough points to give this person the job. And I said... When are we going to ask ourselves if she can do it? Because I'm convinced she can't. And the customer service director, a lovely French guy, Jean-Marc, said, I'm glad you said that, Mark, because this is definitely not someone that's going to succeed in, in our business. And I turned to my head of recruitment, who was also the third member of the um, panel, and, and said, do you think she can do the job? And she said, well, no, she definitely can't, but that's not the point of this process. That's not the point of this process. And it struck me as, wow, how do you get to that stage? where it isn't the point when you all think she would definitely fail. Interestingly, the candidate afterwards said, I'm glad you didn't offer it for me. It definitely wouldn't have been right for me. And you just have to think, that's, that's what, you know, the, 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 all those years had gone and all we'd become was cleverer. In Unilever in 1989, I introduced a new performance management process and I got massive grades for it um, in my performance uh, review and everyone thought I was brilliant. And I, I remember saying to them, but it hasn't changed how people manage performance at all. It's terrible. I'm so depressed about it. And they said, don't say it's the best performance management process in Unilever. It's gone upstairs and people are going to take it to different countries, etc. And I thought, well, that's crazy. It hasn't changed performance at all. Going to RBS in 2010, I walk into a company that forces, uh, was forcing ratings into a bell curve and, and being told, you've got to um, find us a couple more people better performing and another one that's worth performing and i said well they haven't i've given my performance well that's what we need we've got to get the bell curve and i thought wow that's 21 years of progress for a hr function the point i'm making is just how disconnected we've become very cleverer but disconnected engagement had a conversation with another company um and i won't name that one um where he said yes we're flying on engagement i have the best engagement scores now I have something else to talk to you about. I'm worried my people won't cooperate on the change. They don't want to change, and I'm worried I'm going to fail. And he didn't even see the connection between the two. This whole engagement thing um, we were doing with him, he didn't see as relevant um, to the, that they didn't want to change. How could they be very engaged and yet not want to change? How disconnected was that? Finally, a bit of um, uh, good news in terms of where um, I did have to find a solution. This is in when you're paying people um, within HR, um, we all know that when you work for your boss, your line manager. In a large company, when I, I remember having a company with 2,000 managers that were part of the pay review, how do you allow them freedom to pay the review they want to pay, the salary increase they want to pay, and at the same time control a major budget? You can't just let it free. But if you control it from the center and tell them what to pay, it's very hard for them to carry that message that they don't agree to the person. So you can only do it by technology. You can only do it by having a system that allows a constant conversation up and down the line and to the point where everybody is happy with the decision that frontline manager is going to take. I built that. It worked incre incredibly well. And most importantly, and this is important for the whole presentation, you started to find the first line managers having the serious conversations with people about what they were doing and what they deserved to be paid for it. That's the simple thing that they found difficult to do and technology solved. So what I've tried to do with all those stories is explain what I mean by clever but disconnected. If we really stand back and look at ourselves, we haven't made the progress on the simple stuff that the design managers find difficult to do. We've just got a little bit cleverer. So um, how does that make us feel? This is how I think it makes us feel. Many HR professionals I've come along who are trying to do things for the, what the business is demanding today are finding themselves wrapped up in what I call a tangled web of cleverness. And we've got to address that and start to put ourselves in a position where we can do the right things for our businesses. So we face this crossroads, and technology is driving us here. We could either go left and go and be clever, a bit more clever and a bit more disconnected, or we can choose now to start focusing on what people in business are asking us for, to help them do the simple stuff that they found difficult for so many years, how we can use technology to make this simple stuff work. 
And uh, Art, we're going to stop now um, just to see your reaction to this initial statement before we get into what this might mean and, and what language we need to talk with business to move forward. So I'm going to hand to Jamie now, um, who's going to talk you through the poll question. Thanks very much, Mark. Uh, as I said, hard-hitting uh, intro, um, very interesting. I like the simple message. It's, it's amazing how hard it is to do simple stuff well. And I think as Mark talks about this common language, you know, that, that really is a core question people are talking about in HR at the moment. How do we communicate? You know, what do we talk about? Because the way you communicate really tells you what, what you consider to be important. So uh, it's a crucial point. I know Mark's going to talk more uh, about that soon. So uh, on this poll question, we thought it would be interesting to find out what your main obstacles are to going uh, to this kind of back to basics HR uh, and moving towards what you see uh, as the future of HR in your organization. Um, so on that poll question, have a look in the group chat and just start typing some thoughts. There's no need uh, you know, just for one word answers, just have a few thoughts or what's happening in your organization after listening to Mark's uh, intro, um, and there can be a range of, of you know, things here, uh, don't only focus on the process, think about change, perhaps uh, uh, engagement strategies, senior leaders, those types of things. We'll just give you 20 seconds or so to come up with a few um, ideas and then we will um, and I'll push your answer over to Mark and Mark can give you uh, some context based on his experience uh, over the last 20 years. So we're starting some uh, interesting answers in now. So Joanna says, time and resource. Are we understaffed to respond to the changing demands? And that's an interesting uh, point there. You know, is, is this just a problem of resource? Is this, the, is this uh, a key message that people understand that they can't respond to it because of time constraints? Um, Emma saying, hi everyone, we are looking at how HR will need to change for an aging workforce. Uh, and how uh, that will impact on this message. Uh, Alexandra said, I totally agree with the statement that doing simple stuff is difficult, and also the path to doing that is complex uh, as well. So again, like I was saying, it's really hard to do the simple stuff. Uh, a couple of comments about tech, uh, senior leaders as well. Um, that's obviously you know, a problem. If, if you see this change coming, uh, but senior leaders don't, where do you go from there? Mark, are these the, the type of uh, answers you would be expecting? What do you think? Uh, yeah, um, great, great comments. Um, I, I'm going to try and help you understand what the, the challenge you're wrestling with, um, but you, you are absolutely right. The senior leaders one, let me just speak to that. That, um, that is a problem. Um, I'm still having conversations. I, I, I am, I've moved on. I was sitting around a table talking about whether we can allow people to carry their mobile phones in. Because um, you've got people, you know, like me, that were born. Um, I got to 21 before the first mobile phone came out. We we, we are still struggling with security and can they have their own mobile phone at, at work? We we're very detached at that top table at the moment, um, and it is hard um, when you start talking about what needs to happen um, when the people that are making the decision, um, you know, are are struggling with the change and to feel the change. Absolutely. In terms of understaffed. Um, this is the big challenge. Um, HR are tied up in this tangled web of cleverness. We, we're doing lots of things that the business aren't happy with, and we're very busy doing their job for them half the time. We have to use technology. Technology is your answer. It, it's the only way you're going to get the people managers managing their people, freeing up, uh, I'm afraid, let, that if, however many you think you've got now that's understaffed, you'll have half of that by 2020. Um, you'll have less resource, and therefore you have to use technology to get um, HR to be done by the people managers so that HR can start to drive this and constantly drive it. The changes that I'm, I'm going to talk about in a moment mean that you're constantly struggling to keep the simple stuff simple, um, and that's where we need to put our time. So I can understand. Great comment. It's not easy, um, but it's a great opportunity. Mark, can I just uh, jump in here? We just had a couple of uh, extra comments uh, come through, slightly different uh, from what we had before. So um, Alexandra says, in our company, we're now dealing with HR metrics for the future. It is our vision for the business future, but integrating them with the metrics and analyzing data uh, consistently can be hard. 
Uh, what's your vision about dealing with business focus metrics aligned with HR metrics? Uh, Alexander, I know that Mark will come into that, uh, and actually uh, aligning the business with HR is a core part of the second half of this presentation, so stay uh, tuned for that. Uh, Alexia says training managers need to learn how to communicate effectively with staff. Uh, completely agree, and I think this is where the simple stuff uh, becomes so complex because it is this communication problem. How do people ask the right questions uh, and, and have the right conversations? And again, Mark's going to be talking about uh, that as well. So uh, with that, Mark, I'll hand back to you. Okay. Um, I love the, um, some of those questions. I'm going to carry on with the presentation, but I'm just going to make one comment. Um, for as long as HR metrics aren't business metrics, they are not central metrics. Um, you know, you, they have to, the, the, what you call the HR metrics have to become what business looks at to manage their people um, for them to take us where we need to go. Let's, let's get into some of this, though. Um, and this slide here um, is a strange-looking slide in many ways. I'm just trying to get to the point that, uh, that what's difficult about the simple stuff is it's people on people. It's about a, a, a manager telling somebody what they're worth in terms of pay and whether they should get more or less. So you've just given a conversation I've just had. You have to help the manager to get to that. It's still going to be a difficult conversation, but we can help them. First, firstly, if they feel they've made the decision, they're much likely to be able to have that difficult conversation and say, this is what you deserve, you shouldn't get any more. Um, so that's why technology can help that. Just things like telling people what's important, telling people what a good performance is. Um, it's not, if you just say something one way, shout it out and walk off, you don't know if they've heard it, how they've taken it, um, whether they've understood it in the right way. Technology allows a conversation to happen with lots of in, large groups of employees with their managers so that you get to a point where everyone does understand what's important. They do understand what good performance is. On poor performance, it's very, very hard. We all know that. It's very hard for a manager to tell somebody, I told you to do something, you're not quite doing what I wanted you to do great guy and all that, but you're not doing what I wanted you to do. They don't like saying it. Um, and if they can't remember exactly what they said before, exactly what other people do, and if they haven't got metrics that show that this person really is performing lower than others, if they, can't, if they haven't got some certainty, more certainty, it's very hard for them to say you're doing badly because they know the person's going to react and say, no, I'm not. So we have to help them with every way we can with technology so they're at a point where they can then have the conversation. Um, you know, ultimately, the last one on difficult decisions, it's very simple. You, you know, the further you see, the further you'll jump. And if our, if our metrics, as someone just mentioned, aren't believed enough by business, they will not jump far with their decisions. And, and in a fast-moving world, a competitive world, we need to give them um, data, metrics that allow them to see far so they can jump far. And technology is at the heart of it, but it comes down to uh, an, an emotion. I'm, I'm scared to make that big decision. Well, here's some insight, real commercial insight. Yes, you're right. We must do it. I'm jumping. That's the process. Um, it's not how clever our metrics are put together and how they look and the tables and all that. It, it's about whether it helps that manager to make that jump. And, and, and it's simple, but very really difficult. So let's, let's just talk about this myth. They don't not do it because they don't understand or they don't know how to do it. Over the years, um, business has found other ways to win other than putting customers at the heart and putting employees at the heart. And yes, I know there's all kinds of businesses that are really good that have uh, bucked the trend, but we all got to accept, on the whole, customers have not been at the heart of businesses and employees have not been at the heart of businesses. And that's because with size, with scale, with investment, with the ability to spin, create brands, um, and, you know, just um, the, the ability to invest that others can't, to create barriers to entry. Business has had a way of winning without um, having to be close to their customers. But this is what's changing. And let's look at some of these changes um, that are going on. First one, top left, um, talks about the generational change, millennials. Um, interesting fact, 75% of the workforce will be millennials by 2025. Um, who are these millennials? Um, they, they want passion and purpose um, in their role. They don't just want a job. They want more than that. Um, they want ethical business and conscious capitalism. They're tech savvy. They've been brought up with it. 
they're very well informed about all kinds of things they, and they expect to be. They express their opinion regularly. They are well connected to consumers. Consumers are well connected to the world. What that means is in Workforce 2020, um, customers and employees will know the truth about your company, what your company's doing and how well they're doing it. Whether you want them to know or not, they're going to know. And um, that means they will act and they will act collectively. You'll get customers, hundreds of thousands of them, as an example in the UK, where they say, let's not be customers of this company anymore because it's not the right company. Let's move. Things are going to start happening. You'll go, and, and that goes to the bottom right, technology. Because of the transparency, because they can see what's happening, they will start to act and drive change. It's always been about the people. We are a group of people. It's always been about people, customers and employees. But it's now really starting to show. Bottom left globalization makes it even harder. Globalization means your customers, your employees, your suppliers are in different countries. And what business needs to know is what's the best place for me to serve that customer from or to get that supply from. That's what they need to know. And they need to know it like they used to have when they managed locally. You know, should I um, produce in that plant or that plant, um, that factory, that factory? They need to know, do I, do, should I supply from France? Do I supply from China? What, 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 should, what should I do? What's the ability? What's the willingness of people to work? That's what they're looking for. You need to be able to give them that, those answers so they can have that conversation. And I think we're a long way from meeting that need right now. And, and finally, economic cycles. Things are changing. In most places, business are looking forward and thinking, I need to invest and I need to meet the needs of the changes happening. And there's no surprise if you go on any of the big four, they will tell you the biggest HR activity being requested from the consultants right now is write me an HR strategy. What that means is that's the start of a process where they say, I'm not sure how to deal with these big challenges. Help me. And then they'll start to try and deal with them. So that's what's happening. And why is it happening? Um, because this is um, the world I've been operating in for 28 years. Um, you know, on the blue, you've got the people who are saying, you've got to put employees and customers first. And they're a strong campaigning unit, lots of different um, um, influences in that area. But the orange um, guy um, is saying, yeah, I understand it would be nice if we could do the right thing for the customer or the right thing for the employee, but this is a business not a social club. This is a business, not a charity, that kind of thing. That's what's happened in the world I've grown up in. That's what's changing. And it's changing because technology is showing these cold-hearted businessmen, in, uh, the senior businessmen, that this is where the money is. The money's with the customer and our ability to serve them. And once these two groups become a community of change, and they already are, the power of that, of those two working together, we have to do the right thing by the employees and customers, is, is starting already to be powerful. In the next few years, it will accelerate. Um, let me give you an example. What does that mean? What would this powerful community of change um, demand and that technology can now deliver? It's going to demand customer lifetime value. Now, I'd be surprised if any of you are working in a business that isn't starting to look at customer lifetime value. That, well, not many businesses have, 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 have finished that journey. But what that means is that, that you can't, if you miss badly serve a customer, you'll start to know the cost of that over the lifetime of that customer. And it becomes a much serious issue. That's about them really getting the importance of a customer. Profit per employee, AIB in America, I was really impressed with the work they're doing with big data and, um, and their new HR systems, really getting closer to how much profit is each employee making. Um, and now they haven't, I don't think, finished that journey. No one has, in my view, but people are really advanced. What happens when you start to be able to say, I know how much profit I'm making per employee, and I can look at that on a global basis? It fundamentally changes the way the world works. Even a silly example, you're in a, um, a call center um, um, selling things, and you give them um, coffee that's free, and then the HR person says, I've saved you 2,000 euros um, uh, a week by charging them for coffee. And suddenly you see the change in real engagement and you see the change in the profitability of the employee and suddenly you've lost 200,000 pounds. That HR person isn't hiding anymore or getting the glory of the 2,000 pound change. They're saying, why didn't you understand how that was going to impact the people? Um, and finally, people manager index. This is a, a story I'll be quick with because of time. But um, in T-Mobile, this is where a, a good news story, where they demanded our people managers aren't good enough. We have to improve our people managers. 
But we go, we go to the senior people and they say, yeah, there's a reason for that one. He's not that bad. And yes, loads of long-term sick or loads of people with grievances or um, whatever. Um, but that's, you know, they, they are a good manager most of the time. What we did is, is look at 29 different things that indicate, indicators, variables of, of what might suggest if a people manager is good or not and put it into one live index. Um, and that live index um, it's basically, if it looks like a duck, waddles like a duck, quacks like a duck, it's a duck. And eventually, you've got the leaders to say, I get that. My, my guys aren't, that guy, those guys aren't good. Those guys are good. I need to do something about it. And it transformed the quality of people management. And that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. You know, yes, it sounds a bit clever because it was a bit clunky technology back then. And hopefully new technology makes that kind of thing much easier. But if you start to think it through and really work at the difficult stuff, suddenly they start dealing with people managers and, and, and getting good people managers into the business. And that transforms everything that you do. So that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. Let's just understand the world of business that you'll be working in in 2020. Technology and transparency will create this. All of that, I'm big and powerful and rich and I can get big brands and squeeze you out of the market, this is all gone. It's not about ownership anymore. It's about access. And it's about a simple spine of success. You must know your customers. You know what they, you have to be brilliant at to deliver for those customers. You then know what your employees have to have the ability to be brilliant at, and you must ensure your employees want to be brilliant at that. And, and you need to be able to tell the company everything to do with that. And if you're unable to speak about those, that spine and that flow, um, you will not be at the heart of business by 2020. Okay, so let's talk about what Peter Cheese might have been getting at. What is the um, language that business wants to talk about? And, you know, it is very simple. In my experience, there are only four things they actually care about. They care about, are my people able and willing to do what I need them to do? They care about how much that costs them. And they care about whether they can focus on what's important when it's important. If suddenly they need a particular ability or a, particularly, a particular willingness to do something, they want it there so they're able to achieve what they need to do at that moment. So able, willing, cost, focus, that's the language. Now, some people say um, to me, and they're right, isn't able and willing all part of performance? And it is, but it's very dangerous if you start just talking about performance because there's two very different things, able and willing. Are people able, are they willing? Think about climbing a mountain, um, you want to know, are they able to climb the mountain and are they willing to climb the mountain? Um, and if they don't climb it, it's going to be for one of those reasons. And you need to go talk to business about that. Um, you need to talk about and then cost and focus, as I said. Let's just get on to um, some of the stuff about language. And it's not so much. We have to change the language because it's been misunderstood by business and, frankly, by HR too. So let's look at able and competence. Um, what business want to know, you know, look at my, my climb mountain story, are they able to climb the mountain? They don't want us to tell them, actually, we can show they've got many of the competencies in place that would suggest they can. What I found in business is when they start to involve in the conversation, they want a more certain answer to something that isn't easy, and everyone's going to be on the other side, well, you know, it's very difficult to know if they can actually um, climb the mountain. It's much easier just to measure their competencies. It might be, but it's not what business wants, guys. What they want is are they able to climb the mountain? Engagement, go back to my example. They don't want to know if they're proud of the company, happy with their line manager. They want to know if they're willing to change, in using the example I had. Are they willing to do what they're meant to do? And that's what engagement was meant to mean. Are they engaged in, in what the business wants to do? And we've created engagement into something a bit different. Happier employees are correlated with more efficient businesses. Well, it's interesting to managers, but what they really want to know is, are they willing to do what I need to do? Cost and payroll, I just used that as an example, and Bridget referred to all the differences in the different countries, and we can give people payroll costs. I mean, if that's not the actual cost of having those employees doing that work, it's not what business want to know. We have to tackle some of that really messy stuff um, and get a consistent view of what cost is so that businesses will make difficult decisions on it. And finally, on talent, um, it is all about talent, but what do we mean by talent? Just ask people in your business, what do you think you mean by talent? You'll find that people struggle to define it. Um, what it really is about is focus. 
have I, am, have I got now and will I have in the future the abilities and the willingness I'm going to require to be better than my competition? Will I have that? Will I be able to focus on those things that matter most then? There's no such thing as a talented person. It's like water. Um, you know, water is talent only when you're thirsty and water is scarce. That's how I look at it. When you've got plenty of water and you've had a good drink, it's no longer talent to you. And, and, and we have to recognize that because business agrees with us one month and by the following month what we're saying to them is not of interest. And it's because their focus has changed and we haven't. So this is the language we have to get to um, to um, really engage in the conversation. Um, and then we need to look at um, what I call the engine um, of HR tech and uh, of the HR um, uh, world. The, it's, it's what we call the, it's part of the people machine. There is a machine in every co company that drives the ability people have, the willingness they have, the cost they have, and the focus they have. It's not always HR driving it, though. Where is the power coming from to change people? You have to understand that. And if you've got a good engine and a great HR function, they are the engine. They are taking the power from the business, the business strategy, and they are directing that power and enabling the business to manage their people to get the right ability, willingness, cost, and focus. We own that engine. We should own that engine, and it's all about technology. Just moving on to the last thing that we need to be concerned about, and that's the People Foundation. Yes, we can, um, ha we can build a great engine with great systems and processes that enable people managers to manage the ability to manage willingness, to get cost right, and to focus the business. But if we build that on weak foundations, it won't survive. So over a few decades, if we've, if, if we've got the wrong leaders, we're talking about that. And I don't, we, we've done the research. We know what the right leaders are, things like being authentic, um, diverse um, leadership. That's what we want. But you, we all know what we have is a particular type of leader, um, and it isn't the right leader. Now, unless we make a change to that, we really face into that and change our leaders, um, we won't have a, a foundation that's strong enough. And there's other aspects of the foundation, uh, People Foundation, that's important, that you have to get right if you're going to, if you're going to be able to fix these issues for business. And, and the reason I, I um, raise this is because what you're going to find is business wanting quick fixes. And you're going to find a way to fix the engine, and you're going to find a way to fix um, some of these things, able, willing, cost, and focus, if you pick up this new language. But unless you look deep into your foundation, for example, your technology, if, you, if your technology is wrong, if it's a legacy system, if it's not, you know, my view, um, if it's not mobile, for example, um, it isn't right. You've just got to accept, even if you bought it three or four years ago, it's wrong. You've got, you've got to change it and put in place um, what you need for this future as it happens. And you'll be under pressure from business to just move things quickly, but you can't. If people don't trust you, you have to rebuild the trust of your employees before you start driving um, their real engagement, their real willingness to, to change as you want them to. You've got to get back to the basics. And it's not going to be easy, but you're going to have to do it or it's not going to work. And just on terms of suppliers, anyone on those suppliers um, or systems um, providers, you have to change to um, – there is um, – um, let, uh, let me just get to that because I think this is uh, very relevant, that um, you, I think in the past a lot of, there's been some overselling, selling cleverness and trendy stuff. It's whether it fits um, is, is what's important. Is it going to help you to drive your people machine? Is it you know, not about clever facts or features, but real commercial insight needs to be coming from these people that supply services and systems? It's not about lowest price anymore. It's true strategic partners, and they can't have wrappers. They can't start overselling and saying they're more than they are because you'll know they're not. So um, these guys have to work that out. And just going back to this slide before, what it all means, it, it won't be fair because business will get the best people to sort these issues out. The good news is they're starting to be really important to business, and by 2020 they will be. And the challenge is if you're not the best at meeting that challenge, they'll ask someone else to do it. And I, I refer to the Ram Charon article, Harvard Business Review article, where he's starting to suggest that um, HR just do the administrative side and we get operations or finance people to do the leadership and organization and all the basically the, the able, willing, cost, and focus stuff. Um, it's all about technology, 
um, if we as HR are going to prove we are the strongest and right ones to meet this challenge. So if I recap, the technology um, was not used right, was a bit clunky um, in the past. Um, customers, employees weren't at the heart of business. They had, and business had other ways to win. The new world by 2020, different technology, social media, millennials, all these changes, um, you know, change the world fundamentally and in a very positive way, in my view. And it's absolutely putting customers, employees at the heart of, of business. And that's a very good thing, but a very challenging thing, because it means we need to get that people on people thing right. And it's got to be us that use technology to get these difficult things met so that um, we're able to deliver the customers, uh, to, uh, the customers what they need by having the employees that are required with the ability and the willingness. It's all about transparency and access. It's no longer about control and spin. And for me, that is a very good thing for this function. Um, we are the strongest people to meet this um, challenge. We should be the ones that can deliver the simple but difficult. There are examples of people already starting to do it. But if the function as a block goes left, then it will go where welfare was, where personnel is, and where HR will end up, unless it can stop being clever but disconnected and start being simple but difficult. That's, that's the message. It, it's maybe a hard message. I think it's an optimistic one. It might not sound that way, but I'm optimistic. I've set a company up on the back of it. Um, I believe um, we have a great future for the management of people. Um, we can improve the working lives of people. We can improve the status of HR, but we will not do it if we use technologies just to be a bit more clever. We have to use it to deal with this difficult stuff to allow this simple people-on-people -people stuff to work. So with that, I'm going to hand back to Jamie and uh, to continue the webinar. Great. Thanks, Mark. Guys, what do you, uh, what do you think about that? Um, give us some comments. I mean, I, I do agree with Mark. It's an optimistic future. You know, putting, putting customers and people at the heart of a business sounds obvious, and it, and it is obvious. That's the point. But uh, it is just a tough journey to unwind what we've done so far and get back to that. Um, I will just let you know, guys know, we actually have a corresponding white paper with this webinar that Mark's written uh, along with input uh, from ADP. Uh, that will be going live next week. That uh, contains a lot more information about the vision for Workforce 2020 uh, and is easily read with your evening Horlicks or G&T or, or whatever it is you like. Uh, in an evening. So if you do want to receive that, if you drop me a line at editor at hrzone.com, um, then we will make sure that we send you that when it goes live uh, next week. So uh, on to the Q&A. Let's get some questions flowing here. Uh, questions for Bridget and Mark. Um, tell us what you're thinking, what you want to talk about, any problems in your own organization that they can contextualize, just what you feel about this vision for the future. I'm sure there are some strong uh, opinions out there on what, where are we going to go? And I think one of the big questions uh, for all of us is where is HR going to be? There are options of where HR can be, but I think it comes back to uh, the change agenda and, and, and where we go as to where HR will end up uh, within five years. So uh, we'll start with a question for Bridget. Uh, Bridget, is the HR profession moving fast enough uh, to capture the opportunities in emerging trends uh, within HR? Uh, great, great question. Um, I would think if we did a poll for the audience today, we would all say we are moving crazy fast. Um, having said that, are we move, moving fast enough to capture these opportunities? You know, I, I do think we need to move faster there and to be maybe more precise in our movement. Uh, Mark, you, you covered some really key trends. Um, so I won't go deep on globalization, multi-generational multi work forces, but you know, let's talk a little bit about the war for talent. So the reality is as each one of our businesses grow, so do our competitors, and that's creating for all of us an increase in competition for people. Um, and, and we all hear on the news unemployment rates remain high, but we know in HR the quantity of highly skilled workers is lower and is in great demand. So that means in order for each one of us in running our businesses to stay ahead of our competitors, we have to transform our organization and become talent magnets and draw in the top talent. Um, 
We talk a lot about talent mobility at ADP. It's more important than ever. You know, as you look to re-engage your internal talent and really develop their skills. Um, however, in order for us to build deeper skills and, and that whole engagement piece with our associates, um, engage our, our associates quickly and easily, we need to be able to deploy our talents in our fast-growing markets within the organization with, with a talent mobility strategy. Um, a lot of companies struggle with this, and, and the way to accomplish this, is, the reason they struggle is really that lack of visibility in the current organization and the talent pool. So if you couple that with a lack of strategic focus for al and alignment for HR, it really threatens our ability, I think, to react and stay ahead of our, our competition and be ready for 2020. Yeah, I think that's a good point, and uh, especially the strategic focus there, I think that has been lacking, and I think the strategic focus, this common language can really add something uh, and, and, and create a framework where that strategic focus can, can, can come out. Uh, Mark, I'm going to come to you for a couple of questions now. I'm going to be slightly out there and fold two questions uh, into one, because I think they're, they're really good. So Paul says, is there not a danger that HR ends up being fragmented? and HR ending up meaning totally different things to large organizations and SMEs. That's part one. Um, so have a think about that. And then one coming from Sean, who says that uh, employees expect much more from their work and their working lives. Pay is not the ultimate reward, but how do we justify, and this is key, I think, how do we justify the initial cost of focus on people rather than on the bottom line? So do that last question again. I missed the last sentence. Okay, so how do we justify the initial cost of focusing on people rather than on the bottom line of the business? Mm, yeah. Okay. Um, wow. Yeah, that's, um, that is, I think... Um, that battle we've had for decades of um, you stop, you know, you, for big businesses where I've been, quarterly results. By the time you've had one quarterly result, they're worried about the next quarterly result, um, and they don't want any disruption to that. And um, you know, and that you can feel it when you're in those businesses and around those tables. But what I think is happening is a change to that. Now it may have been our world, but I think what's changing is the business leaders are saying, "But hang on." Where are we going to be next year, the year after? How are, how are we competing? Um, how are we going to win? How can we say we're going to win? Um, and uh, investors are demanding more. Shareholders are demanding more. Boards are demanding more. Um, so I think we're in danger of not being ready when that conversation stops happening, when they say, look, don't talk about that. Let's talk about the short term. When they say, look, forget the bottom line. I don't even understand the cost of our people. I don't understand why it's where it is. I don't understand... Um, why it's saying that France is cheaper than um, Spain. I know that can't be true. I mean, anecdotally, it can't be true. You give me the right figures. They'll know that. We'll start to get challenged for that, those numbers. Um, I mean, as for the SME and, and large companies, I don't see it fragmenting at all. I, I see it exactly coming back to something that's very simple. Um, actually, some of the smaller SMEs are doing a better job of the simple things than the larger ones. Um, they haven't had the, the, the money to be, get so clever and disconnected. Um, so we could learn a lot from the smaller companies, in my opinion. But the HR function is, is changing what it's about, but it's, it's becoming the function that knows how to mass produce the simple stuff in the big companies, knows how to, um, there might not even be HR managers in businesses with the way technology is going in SMEs, in small companies. There'll be different kinds of support that help people to manage their people differently. Um, but I, I I mean, there's challenges, but I think we need to focus on, on being the first to meet those challenges rather than how difficult they're going to be, because I'm not sure I like the options. Yeah, that's a, that's a fair point. Um, uh, Paul, hope that answered your question. If you have any follow-up uh, comments for Mark uh, or Sean, do, do put them in the text box. Bridget, I'm going to come to you now about data, because, you know, data-led decision-making and the ability of technology to be transformational and also provide transparency and focus on the needs of the employees, therefore, to meet the needs of the customer is going to be key. So uh, should HR know how to tell the story behind data? Is that going to sit with HR? I love this question. Um, I, I, I will. So, so my first um, confession is, I am not a data geek. It's actually my Achilles heel. 
Um, however, I think HR being able to leverage data is going to be key to our continued success moving forward. So these days we hear a lot about big data. Um, for me, so big data is really thinking about taking, um, you know, in HR we have piles and piles of data that we can stack up. We also have some really key data from, for example, our finance partners, our marketing partners, our clients. How can we connect the relevant data in that pile of data to help tell a story? So for me, as an HR leader, my view on big data is, is really not about can we get all the data out there, but it's what do we do with it. So from a, a workforce analytics perspective, you know, I believe there's been – reports produced for years, big data dumps, if you will, but if we can bring that data together and give it context, it's going to be relevant. So I know what I need in my business, driving sales across outside of North America, and we see this actually, of course, from our clients too, is ultimately once we get big data, how does it compare? How does it compare to other organizations? Um, if you're taking a look from an HR perspective, turnover, you know, other workforce analytics, um, can we do something with those that really enable us to make smart, sound choices and where we invest our business based on, you know, um, maybe where other companies or in other similar industries, similar size, et cetera, are making investments. So I have a clear point of view, Jamie, on, uh, on HR people and data. Great. Thanks, Bridget. Uh, guys, do keep your questions coming. We've still got some time to answer them. Uh, we just had one in from Anne Marie for you, Mark. Uh, ultimately, senior leaders need to take more responsibility and leadership for managing their staff uh, and, and not solely rely on HR. This is the start of employee engagement and gaining employee trust between them and their staff. Do you agree with that? I couldn't agree more. It's... Uh it's all about that. Um, I, I, I guess my message is they're starting to understand that, that it isn't HR's job to manage the people, it's theirs. Um, and they are, they, they are going back to saying, I need you to have a relationship with your people. I need them, you to tell them the difficult things. I need, I need to know who is the more expensive and shouldn't have the job. I need to, I need to know stuff, I need, I, and I don't know it. So I'm ready to take the responsibility. Can you help me to do it? Because at the moment, I, I, I'm struggling. I, I, so I think that's what I'm saying. By 2020, they will have got it. They will be saying, I need to solve these problems. And frankly, some already are saying they need to solve them. And, and we are still too often going along with clever answers that doesn't help them. Well, that's not going to help me do it, you know, and... You, I don't want to do this. It's not giving me what I want. Um, now, they won't keep asking us. They will start to get other people to solve these things for them um, and already are in different businesses. And um, I, what I'm saying is we have, to, we have to believe these changes are happening. You know, the globalization is happening. The technology change is happening. The social media change is happening. You can see it in politics. You can see it in every walk of life. It's changing. So... You know, forget about big data or what, what words you use. Let's just put it very simply, transparency. You will know customers. Customers will know the companies. Employees will know the companies. Uh, you will know how employees impact customers. It will be transparent. You will need to be able to manage people. and The senior manager will take that accountability, and they are going to look for help because we are not set up generally to do that very well, um, to do all of these simple but difficult things that is, are involved in managing people and making big people decisions. We have to start to make a progress as a function there or they'll ask someone else to do it. That's the point. I think also, you know, we are all agreed that line managers are crucial uh, to the business, and that's where the focus will, will be in the future. I mean, from my point of view, that, that is undeniable. They're in the best place. Yeah. Uh, to look after and take care of their uh, employees. So it, it's a vision that's, 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 that's very, very clear. Okay, we'll take a couple more questions. Uh, one coming for you, Bridget, now. Uh, with ever-increasing flexible and remote working into the future and the potential blurring of work life, how can HR help to promote an optimum balance within their workforces? Yeah, this is, this is a great question, and, and I think really where globalization and work-life balance uh, really converge. So, 
I just read today nearly 40% of employees work outside of their organization's home country. So many of those are in remote settings. Uh, people are no longer showing up at company headquarters every day. And as we know, increasingly all generations are looking for different forms of work-life balance, um, maybe part-time work, job sharing, or again, working remote, remotely. So obviously programs that support that flexibility while driving business objectives are key. Uh, I, I actually think the other element of the work-life equation, and Mark, Mark um, connected on it as well, is really HR's role in supporting a performance-based culture. So, you know, if you really are in a performance-based culture, people un uh, understand expectations. They're understa they understand outcomes that they're driving to and how those are going to connect to bottom line performance. And if I'm really clear on that, it's, it's and I wish, Mark, I had your slide with the four, the four words, but I forget which word it is, but the word that says, you know, that I'm really motivated to be climbing that mountain, I have the knowledge and I'm motivated, really lines up, um, and I think can help us be much more flexible in how we do our work. Thanks very much, Bridget. There were, uh, I think there were two of you coming through there. I'm not sure if uh, uh, there's uh, something wrong with your phone, but uh, we got it. We got it twice. But it sounded quite, you know, ethereal. So it was quite, it was all right actually. Uh, okay, guys, uh, we're gonna have to wrap up soon. Uh, we've got a few questions left. Uh, may as well. Uh, there's some good questions coming through. So Paul comes in and says, "Is it just HR that needs to change? Management is often described as a very British disease." Oh, interesting phrase. Promoting people beyond their ability and competence. Mark, what do you make of that? <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I agree. We've got the management we deserve at the moment, um, but I think the world is changing. Um, uh, the British disease thing's interesting. I think um, some countries are changing faster than others because they, they didn't have so much of the old legacy world. and. If you're in um, some of the um, big European, uh, let me call them legacy countries, um, I, I do think they, they have the biggest challenge here. Um, and I listen to some of the conversations in the likes of the UK and compare them to some of the up-and-coming countries. Um, and they're just completely different. Um, you know, India, for example, but, you know, they're going to power past um, a lot of these European countries. Uh, you know, what we all know about China. Um, Brazil and the others, there's many more, because they just are coming up. Um, Africa in the next 10 years, etc. Because they, they just start in a different place. And I think, uh, yeah, absolutely, it's the, um, there's no, no, nothing to say that um, we won't get much, hit much harder in some of the more developed countries, um, because we are going to struggle to change as fast, because our leaders and our management um, just have too much legacy in them. Frankly, though, that's got to be our challenge. That has got to be what we have to address. I think even the cold, most cold-appearing managers in some of these established countries, um, that's just what they've taught. They don't want to manage that way. And I've seen great examples of people be released to be very different kinds of leaders. And that's how they want to live, and it's how they want to lead. I, I think we have a great responsibility here to change the world from the legacy to the new, particularly in some of these old countries like, uh, like Britain. Right, okay guys, Let, let's end on some practical next steps uh, that you can do after this uh, webinar. So firstly, Mark, if I just come to you and say, what, what should HR people be doing right now? You know, is this about promoting this vision, about, about promoting the fact that we, will, we are hurtling towards a different future and educating senior leaders who perhaps don't get this? Uh, or are there other steps uh, we should be doing now? I think if, if, you, if you were just to go away from this and say, I'm going to look at my company through those four uh, windows, um, are our people, have they got the ability to do what's needed? And if the, you'll find there's some obvious gaps. And if you start talking to the business about closing those gaps, you'll find a different um, response. If you start talking about are they willing to do what needs to be done and, and, and what's blocking that, and you start dealing with those things, you'll start to get a different response. Same on cost. If you look at cost and you say, right, how can I get some very accurate and robust data on people cost? And yes, that might mean you've got to get France to agree how they deal with contractors and the UK to deal with how they deal with temps or whatever. But if you can get some of that hard stuff done and real data, they'll respond to you. And the same on focus. If you, if you can do those things, I think you'll see business respond differently to you. 
Um, it's, it's you adopting the new language and looking through the new windows, if you like, able, willing, cost, and focus. That is what I would do coming from this webinar, and I think you'll be surprised at how quickly business come with you. Great. You guys have also got two uh, PDFs uh, in the resource list under the, the left-hand side that are sort of spin-off topics off this, so do digest those. Uh, I will just say, again, we do have an accompanying white paper that Mark's penned uh, with input from ADP that will be going live next week. Uh, that, that's a good few pages, I think, I think about 4,000 words. So it's an in-depth piece that will give you more information about this vision. Um, that will be going live next week. If you want to drop me a line at editor at hrzone.com, I will make sure that you get that as soon as it goes live. Um, and, then, and, and then you can feed back with any uh, extra questions for our, for our panelists as well. I'm sure they'll be, they'll be happy to answer them. It's an interesting discussion. I think you know, with these types of things, we have to keep the debate going, uh, improving and, 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 and putting it out to new people and sort of spreading the word that, that this stuff is all changed because it really is uh, all changed. Uh, on that note, that is just about everything we do have time for today, uh, unfortunately. Uh, we've still got some questions coming through, so it's a shame we can't uh, go on. But thanks very much uh, to everyone for attending. Thanks to Mark and Bridget uh, for presenting. Thanks to ADP uh, for sponsoring this webinar. And yeah, I hope, I hope you've all had uh, uh, some good, interesting, thought-provoking um, you know, thoughts from this, and hopefully it's going to influence uh, your thinking over the next few years um, and hopefully lead to a better world for the HR function as well. So thanks again, everyone, for attending. Hope you enjoyed it.